I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our worship service, our online worship service. My name is Gresford Thomas. I'm the pastor of the Lincoln Amazing Grace Seventh-day Adventist Church. And today we are coming together. We are not able to come together in body, but we are together in spirit, and we are here to worship the Lord and the beauty of His holiness. To get us started, I'd just like to read a text of Scripture found in Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. As you take time today to listen to the songs of praise, to participate in our time of prayer, to hear the, the word, and the title of my message today is Empty Nets, part one, to hear the word of God spoken, may your heart be lifted to the very courts of heaven as it is the desire of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you, we lift you up. We love you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Now bless us, guide us, lift us to the, to the courts of heaven as we take this opportunity to worship you as a body in the beauty of your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Good morning, friends. Happy Sabbath. I'm Shima Lin from the Lincoln Amazing Grace Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're going to worship God together this morning. So glad you could join us. We're going to start out with a song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, that I've loved ever since I was a little girl, growing up as a missionary kid in Singapore. My mom taught a children's choir, and a couple times a week, lots of little kids would come running into our house, and we'd stand there around our piano, and we'd sing while my mom taught us. And this song was one that we sang. We just loved it. All of us kids loved it. And we would sing our little lungs out in our house, and then we'd run outside after choir practice, and we would play in the yards and climb coconut trees all the while singing this song. As we sing it today, I want to invite you to picture what this song is talking about. It talks about how every part of nature is praising God, and we can praise Him too. So lift our let your heart and mind be lifted up as we sing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. It's number 12 in the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal. You can see it online if you want to at sdahymnal.org. joy, do we? Sometimes we make mistakes and we come to God and we cry out and we say, God, please forgive me. I realize how unholy and righteous I am. And when do we see that most clearly? It's when we see Jesus for who he is and we see God as our loving father in heaven and the Holy Spirit as our comforter and our friend. When we see their holiness and their great love for us, our hearts are touched, aren't they? Isaiah felt that way when he saw God in his vision. He said, this is Isaiah 6, verse 5, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. 
I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we see Jesus, we realize our uncleanness, and then we cry out with David, Psalms 26, 1 and 2, Vindicate me, O God, for I walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, prove me. Try my mind and my heart. That's my desire, that God would test every part of me and know whether I'm truly his or not. I want to be fully his. And I'm so grateful for the promise in Philippians 2.13 that says that it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Friends, take courage. God is working in you. He loves you dearly, and he is working in you and will not let you slip. Our faith has found its resting place in Jesus, hasn't it? Let's sing about it. It's number 523. My faith has found a resting place. Let's sing. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I hope everybody is well and safe. And so I was asked to give my testimony. My name is Gina Navaris, and I am 56 and disabled and raising two grandchildren. And I have been blessed by Jesus seven years ago. I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I had spiraled into a self-destruct mode and homeless, and I begged Jesus for his help. And I received the Holy Spirit and got a sense of peace, and I started to follow Jesus. I became a child of God. Um, what Jesus di did for me when he died on the cross, there was Nothing else I could do but um, show him back the love that he has shown for me. I have um, been through a lot of trials. And the latest one was actually um, the blessing, the biggest blessing I've received. I've received many blessings. Um, the court ordered us to have to um, get a house because we were in a one-bedroom apartment and a gentleman that we didn't hadn't seen for 15 years knocked on our door, said that he heard that we needed a home 
and he was moving out of the house and it was eleven hundred dollars and we could get it and by the God's blessing um, we were able to get it and for eleven hundred dollar for a three bedroom home with a large yard in Lincoln is unheard of uh, a couple years later um, there was I wrecked my car and there was a knock on my door and I was received or given a five thousand dollar check to buy a new car so that way I could transport the grandchildren around and um, mostly it's my mother passed away two years ago she was like my everything and um, I was devastated went into a state of depression um, last year when her anniversary came up so this year um, I have just dove into the word and I begged Jesus just to give me the peace that I know that he can bring me and this year I was able to celebrate her life and I didn't grieve I didn't get depressed I didn't do anything but I was joyful for the fact that she's at peace she's at rest no more pain, and the, her next waking moment will be with Jesus. And I'm praying I will be there too. And that we'll all be together again. So, with everything that's going on, and I know Jesus has a reason for allowing this to happen, because there's so many people on the fence that um, need to decide whether to be one with him or be one with Satan. And I hope and pray that the people jump off that fence into Jesus' arms and dive into his word. And I just am thankful that Jesus is in my life and so very blessed of everything that he's done for me. Every time I get down to my last dollar and 30 cents, I get a check in the mail for $50. I open up my door. There's a big bag of groceries. We never go without because Jesus always blesses us continuously. And they put people in our lives, or not they, but Jesus put people in our lives that um, my church is not just a bunch of people that gather together once a week and are weekly Christians. They are, they're my family. They're a unit. We're all one for Jesus. And they act the same every single day of the week as they do of that day of the church on Sabbath day. Phone calls to support you, um, just prayers at any time that is needed. Um, it seems that the Holy Spirit impresses people to know when I need it the most. And I get a phone call. Martha and Bill Tessman, uh, my spiritual mother, uh, I love her so much. Jesus put her in my life so that way I have daily connection constantly with her. If I have, I need prayer, I call her. I've, there's been times I've called her so many times. I'm sure I just blew her phone up, but she always answers. And they have been there to support us in every way, just like my church family. And I just want to thank them all. And I am so thankful that Jesus never gave up on me and that has given me love that I knows no understanding and there's no boundaries and is unconditional. And I love Jesus just as much as he loves me. So I just would like to um, say a quick prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, as always, I give thanks for my life because I wouldn't have a life without you. Lord, I ask that you please put a stop to this um, virus. Heal the people that are sick. And the people that are sitting on the fence, Lord, let them choose you. Let them jump off the fence into your arms and dive into your word. So that way, when this is all over, the doors will be open to our church and everybody will want to walk through to get to know you better, and that we as a family, as your church, can be one with you 
and we can see you and be with you in heaven in your second coming. It's not soon enough that you can come, Lord. And so with that, I would just say thank you, Lord, for everything. And keep your loving, protective arms around everybody. And I thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hi everyone, Eileen Bird here, registered dietitian, and today I'm going to talk to you about sugar. So first I'm going to tell you about a study that was done in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So in this study, they took human blood and they put simple carbohydrates like sugar in it. And what they saw was after they introduced the sugar, the uh, activity of phagocytes, which are an important part of the immune system, actually decreased. Also, if you're eating a lot of sugar in your diet, you're less likely to get more nutrients, more uh, other things that, that might help your immune system, like vitamins A, D, C, and zinc that you'll get, and whole grains, and fruits and vegetables. Ellen White, in the book Councils on Diets and Foods, page 196, said that the free use of sugar in any form tends to clog the system and is not unfrequently a cause of disease. So what diseases can a high intake of sugar cause? Well, a high intake of sugar, because all the fiber is removed, increases your chance of getting obesity. Obesity, in turn, increases your chance of having heart disease. Also, a high intake of sugars uh, increases your triglycerides, which also increase the risk of heart disease. Obesity also increases your chance of getting diabetes, cancer, as well as high blood pressure. Proverbs 25, verse 27 says, it is not good to eat much honey. And honey, of course, has a lot of sugar in it. The 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines recommend not to have more than 10% of your calories from added sugar. So what about fruit? So fruit has sugar in it. However, it also has a lot of fiber in it and it has a lot of vitamins and minerals. So fruit actually does not count toward added sugar, which the dietary guidelines say to limit. What about fruit juice? Well, in fruit juice, you have the vitamins and minerals. So if you have orange juice, for example, you'll get your vitamin C. However, all the fiber is removed. And when you have the, the juice left without the fiber, it actually has as many calories as soda. You may be getting more sugar in your diet than you realize. There are a lot of foods that have what I like to call added sugars in them. For example, salad dressing and ketchup a lot of times have a lot of sugar added. Also, some cereals have a lot of sugar in them. So this cereal actually is a good cereal. It has no added sugars, but a lot of cereals, not just the, the kids cereal that you know has a lot of sugar in it, but a lot of cereals that you might think are really healthy have a lot of added sugar. Granola, for example, usually has a lot of sugar in it. So it's a good idea to always look at the nutrition facts to see how many grams of added sugar there are. And you wanna to look to see what the serving size is to see how much sugar you're actually getting. Do you have trouble with eating too much sugar? James 5 verse 16 says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Can I pray with you right now? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given us in your Bible and in Ellen White's writings. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to limit our intake of sugar so that we can be healthier, have a healthier immune system, and also be able to do more for you. 
And we thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering these prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The question of suffering on this planet is one of the most difficult questions that we have to address in life. And it, there are no easy answers. Fortunately, the Bible has answers in the book of Job that we can understand and have wisdom about that we can't get from any other place. And most importantly, the book of Job helps us to dispel two important myths about suffering. The first myth is that good people don't suffer, that only that suffering is a result of something that we did. We see that in the book of Job, Job did nothing to deserve the suffering that came upon him. It was entirely an artifact of Satan uh, created by him, um, but allowed by God for a purpose. So on one hand, we can understand that suffering does happen to everybody. It's not just something that only happens because you did something. It's not a moralistic idea. Uh, suffering happens when you live on this planet. But secondly, we also can dispel the notion that suffering is something that's completely random, that's out of control, that just happens because we live on this planet. We can see that there are forces and spiritualities behind suffering. We see that in Job's case, Satan was responsible for the suffering. God allowed it for a purpose, but yet he ultimately controlled the suffering. He controlled what Job went through and he brought it to an end once his purpose was accomplished. God doesn't like suffering, he doesn't create suffering, but sometimes he has to allow it for a greater purpose. And that's what we learn from the book of Job. But there's something that was a benefit even through all the suffering that we see that Job received. In Job chapter 42 and verse 5, he says this, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. There's something about the suffering that Job went through that gave, gave him a greater understanding of who God was, a greater insight into God's character, a greater insight into the great controversy story that's happening in our world that we see played out every day, even today. As we look at that and we think about Job's experience, we can think about this one blessing that we can get out of all our experiences, and that is that through it, we can have a deeper understanding of God. We can know him better, not just by hearing about him, but actually seeing him. The important thing is that through all this and what we learned from Job is that he remained thankful to God. He remained in an attitude of praise and worship to God. And that is how he got that benefit and was able to learn from the suffering and not just see it as a random occurrence beyond his control, beyond anyone's control. He saw that God was in charge because he praised God, he thanked God. And one of the things that we can tangibly do to thank God, to give him praise, is to show him our trust and faith in him through our finances, uh, through faith that when we give him as part of what we have, that he will provide for us and take care of the rest of our needs. So it's important in these times, in these times of suffering, that we do continue to remember that. And how much should you give? How much should you uh, consider in your giving? How do you know how much to give? Well, here's what you should do. Ask God. Simply ask him and pray, what would he have you to give? Uh, what would be his answer for your giving component of your life, your praise and your trust in him. Just ask him. And if he directs you to uh, give to your local church, we have ways of doing that. Um, you can go online to lincolnadventist.org. Click on the link for donation, lincolnadventist.org. Also, you can send a check in by mail to 150 Lincoln Boulevard, suite number 104, box number 104 in Lincoln, California, 95648. Sometimes I feel afraid to share my faith. I know I shouldn't be, but sometimes I am. And I was praying earlier this week, God, give me boldness. I know there's people I should be sharing with, but I'm just afraid. And God showed me this verse, Isaiah 40, verse 9, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up on the high mountains, O Jerusalem, 
you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. God reminded me that the news that we have to share about Jesus, it's all good news. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And so I went and shared the, some things with people that I had, God had been putting on my heart that I needed to reach out to. And they responded well. And I'm just praying that God continues to work on their hearts. So if you feel like me and you're shy, and you don't know how to share your faith sometimes, pray for boldness because God will give it to us. And I still need it. So pray for me that we can all have the boldness we need to share God in the way that he would have us to. But I'd like to pray right now for our world. So many are hurting and for God's work that it will go forward and that many, many people can come to know him during this difficult time. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, I praise you that you are a God who knows our weakness. You recognize when we're afraid and you speak to us. Thank you for the words of encouragement you gave me this week. And I just, I praise you that you are speaking to each one of my brothers and sisters personally as well. I pray that they would hear your voice and that they would, um, as they study the Bible, that it would come alive for them because you are speaking to them through it. Your word is precious, Lord, and help us to never be ashamed of the good news that we have to give about the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, that you have good news. And it's the good news of salvation. And so I ask, Lord, that you would please make us bold to share you and that many, many people would come to know you. I pray especially for the It Is Written um, program that's happening starting this weekend, that you would bless that. It's over 40,000 people have signed up for it, that they would come to know you through that. And God, so many people are hurting because of this COVID-19 and because of loss of jobs. And I just, God, I pray that in this challenge, in this suffering that people are facing, that you would be close, that you would give them comfort and peace, and that you would be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Show us how to reach out to and minister to our community. I pray for the city of Lincoln. Thank you so much for the good things you are doing there. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with every one of the people who live in Lincoln, that they would have your comfort and your peace, and that they would come to know you as their best friend and savior. Guide our church, Lord that we can continue to draw closer to you and to each other and share you with all those we need. I pray especially that during this time of quarantine that we would have extra time and then we would spend it with you and not with anything else so that we can grow in our walk with you. Thank you, Jesus, that you hear us, that you love us, and we just praise you that you are working even when times are difficult. We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. You know, as a child, I remember having a great interest and desire to go fishing. It's not something my father grew up doing or anyone in my family grew up doing, so I had no one to take me. But for me, it looked like something that was fun and, and challenging to do, especially when you saw someone actually catch a fish. So I remember having a conversation with my, with my father as a, as a boy and, 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 and saying, Dad, you know, I, I would like to, to, uh, for you to take me fishing. Or perhaps you could get a small uh, rod and reel for me and I could go on my own. Well, my father really didn't know the first thing about fishing. He knew a lot about other things, but fishing he knew nothing about. But he did see my interest and desire to want to do it. I made it very clear to him by asking him on numerous occasions. And so in an attempt to, to, to feed my passion and my interest, he purchased a small net for me. Now, I believe he meant well, or maybe he just was looking for the cheapest way to go fishing. I, I'm not sure, but I, I do believe he meant well. But the net that I got, it was just a, a, a small uh, net. It, it was not designed to, to actually catch fish. It, its function was more to simply hold the fish in place once someone caught the fish. Now, I didn't know that at the time. So I, what I remember is now I have a way to catch fish. Now I have a way to go fishing. Now, it's not the same way that those other people are doing it, but I, I think that this will work for me. So I, I remember, I, I distinctly remember incidents of going on picnics, uh, church picnics, and, and having my net, telling my mother I'm going to go down to the, 
to the lake where everyone else is swimming. I want to go off to another spot, and I, I wanted to go fishing. I remember standing by the shore and attempting to catch sunnies, or sunfish. And, and I remember this particular time waiting for about, it must have been, it felt like an hour. It's probably 15 minutes, but you know, as a kid, it felt like an hour. And I, and I remember the excitement that came over me as I, as I saw a little sunny. Oh, that's actually pretty big. It looked big enough to catch in my net anyway, kind of slowly swimming by in my field of vision. I looked down into the water, and as I saw the fish approach, I had my net in hand, and I struck the water. But as you can imagine, as soon as the net hit the water, the fish was gone. <laughs> that didn't discourage me, though. I, I, I tried again and again and again, always striking the water with my trusted net and always ending up with an empty net. For years after that, I had my trust in net, and every time I would get near a body of water, I would attempt to catch a fish with the net. But the result was always the same, an empty net, and the reason was simple. I, I thought I was using the net correctly. I relied on, on my understanding of its use, what I thought made sense, and the end result was always an empty net. It wasn't until years later that I learned the proper use of that net. It wasn't until years later that I, that I learned how to fish using a rod and reel. I was, I was a teenager at that point, uh, much older, and had some friends take me out fishing. And we actually used that net to, to, uh, to hold the fish in place before we uh, released it. Now, you know, as I, as I thought about that incident, it reminded me of, the, of a story in the Gospels of Luke and John. There's, there's a, it, it's a different stories, but both of these narratives are the stories of empty nets. In these accounts, we, we see the fishermen, though, unlike me, the fishermen in these accounts were masters at fishing with nets. But what we find is, is that their attempt at fishing resulted in empty nets until they submitted to the control of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go into the word of God. Father, we are just so grateful today to have the opportunity to open and study your word. Father, I pray that you would open my lips so my mouth will declare your glory. May the words that I speak be seasoned with your love and grace. Lord, um, as we're going through this very uh, uncertain time, I pray, God, that you would grant peace to every person that is participating uh, in, in this particular recording. I pray that they receive a blessing from what they hear today, and I pray for the peace that passes all understanding through Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen and amen. Two stories, both about fishing, and both had the same initial result until Jesus intervened. And that initial result is empty nets. Now these narratives are, are primarily focused on an interaction between Jesus and Peter. Of course, other disciples were fishermen and they happened to be in the vicinity as well. And they were more observers we see in scripture, but they were also impacted by the intersection of Jesus and the empty net. The story we're going to look at today takes place at the beginning of the relationship with Jesus and his disciples. In fact, it takes place before they were actually his disciples, before Simon was a disciple of Jesus. He was Simon the fisherman before he became Peter. The second narrative, which we'll look at next Sabbath, takes place just before Jesus ascends to heaven following his resurrection. So we see that the beginning of the relationship of, of Simon and Jesus, and at the end of their relationship, their face-to-face -face relationship of now Peter and Jesus. In each instance, Jesus uses the empty nets to teach Peter or Simon a lesson 
to help him advance in his relationship with Jesus, as well as understand his mission in life. These same lessons are applicable for us today as we we are desiring to become followers of Jesus Christ. Today, we will look at the first narrative found in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 5, verses 1 through 8. If you don't, that's fine. Just listen along as I go through and read. Luke 5, verses 1 through 8. I may read a little further on, but I want to focus on 1 through 8 because that's where we want to uh, get an idea of what's happening here. It says, So it was, as the multitude pressed about him, this is Jesus, to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake. I guess they were sitting on the water, not necessarily standing. Continue. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he, stopped, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. We're going to stop there for now. This is very early in the ministry of Jesus. His ministry is just getting started. In fact, at this point, he, he has not called any of his disciples yet. He's just getting started with his ministry. Now, he has performed miracles, and he's performed many acts of compassion on people for the masses, but Luke 5 is focusing on his teaching. He's now teaching the masses, and we see it also at the end of chapter 4. The Bible tells us that when the people came out, they came out to hear the word of God. Now, hearing the word of God, friends, is a powerful experience. I'm not talking about my preaching. I'm talking about hearing the Word of God, hearing it read, hearing, allowing it to come and intersect in your life. The purpose is to build a relational bond with Jesus. This was the intent of Jesus as he approached these two boats. He wanted to build a closer relational bond with them. He was preaching to the multitudes, but he had a special plan for the fishermen who were going about their business. Now, the Bible says, as we, that's just an intro, we see he's preaching the word of God, and, and the multitudes are listening, and, and, they're, and they're washing their nets, and, and we see what's happening is that they're also listening as well. But the Bible tells us that he observed these, these fishermen, On the side, these business partners, you had Peter, who had a boat, and you had James and John, who also had a boat, had a little partnership going on there, and they were washing their nets after a very unsuccessful day of fishing. In other words, there were no fish in the boat, and the disciples still had to clean those nets. In this case, they were washing their nets, which, which would show that, oh, this, this was a, a failed day. We went out, we didn't catch anything, and now we're washing our nets and looking at our empty boats. In fact, we're told in, in verse 5 that, that they worked all night without any success. But Jesus had not yet intervened. We're going to get there in a moment. Friends, as I look at what it says about the disciples, that they were washing their nets, 
I think about us sometimes. Sometimes we, we wash our empty nets. Nets that have not been used, yet nets that have not been touched by the hand of Jesus. We've been praying. We've been working. We've been asking God to help us through a situation. Maybe a sickness, maybe a, a, a financial setback. Perhaps it's just anxiety and, and thinking about what's going on with this COVID-19 crisis. Whatever it may be, your, your work and your toil is great towards God. Your petitions to God are, are heartfelt. Your petitions to God are many, but nothing's happening. You haven't caught any fish. You haven't caught a break. You've caught nothing in the way of, of God's intervention. So perhaps maybe it's time to take a break from seeking God and, and start trying to make it happen on our own. We start to wash those nets and put them to the side. Maybe we'll use it a little later instead of waiting on the Lord. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, that it is God himself who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We also give an encouragement in Psalm chapter 27, verse 14, to wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In other words, friends, as, as we wait on God, God is also waiting to use and, and work through our circumstances of nothing happening to cause something great to happen for our benefit. But our job is not to just go off to the side when it seems like we haven't caught any fish in our nets and our, our nets are empty and we can't catch the attention of God. Our, our jobs are not to put it to the side and, and just wash them and, and, and just give up. In order for him to work, we need to stop washing our nets and continue to seek Jesus. As we wait on him, he will work through us. Let's see further how this works. Because in this narrative here, we see that, that Jesus is there and, and he's preaching. He's teaching. They're listening. Still washing. Now in verse 4, Jesus has concluded his teaching to the multitudes. And now he turns his attention to these future disciples. And let's see what he tells them. I'm going to read again verses 4 and 5. It says, and he had stopped speaking and said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Friends, on so many levels, Looking at verse 4, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. In so many ways, as I've done a little research on fishing back in those times, this was a, a ridiculous command. From a fishing perspective, it, it, it made no sense at all. The nets that they used, just so we get an understanding, they, they were called trammel nets. It, it was a complex system of netting consisting of three layers. That's why it's referred to as nets instead of just a singular net. And that's how we know it's a trammel net because that's the only type of net that's referred to in, in Scripture that, that uh, is, is said in the plural. Now, this net was made of, of linen, interestingly, interestingly enough, and it required washing after it was submerged into the sea. Because it was made of linen, it would catch all of the, the seaweed and all the debris that was in the sea. So when it came up, whether there were fish that went through it or not, you would have to take time and wash it clean for the next time or else it would lose its effectiveness. Now it says the disciples were fishing all night. Nighttime is the best time to fish using this net. Because at, the, at night, the fish were unable to see the linen netting. In the daytime, they could see the netting and they could turn away from it. And also in the nighttime, they would be closer to the surface since the air and the, the, the water were 
cooler. It was cooling down so they could come to the surface. It wasn't too hot. So they would cast their nets down and, and they would be able to catch many fish. It was, it, it was a tried and true way. It had worked uh, throughout their careers. This is how you fished on the Sea of Galilee. This is how you fished on the Lake of Gennesaret. This is how you did it. So when Jesus comes and he, and he gives the command to go out in the deep, it made very little sense because during the daytime hours, and we don't know how long Jesus was, was preaching, but during the daytime hours, as the sun is now beating down on the water, what happens is the fish, they get hot too, and they descend deeper into the sea to escape the, the excessive warmth caused by the sun. And these nets, uh, on, the other, on the other hand, too, uh, these nets, in addition to what I'm, I'm saying about the, the warmth, these nets were not designed to be used in the deepest part of the sea. They were meant to be used in, in, in more shallow water. So fishing during the day with a net that the fish could see and avoid, in part, of the sea, that they could avoid the net, and using a net that was not designed for the depths of the sea made no sense. So Jesus was asking them to take this net, go out in the deep water, take this net that's made for shallow water, and, and drop it down. And also, I need you to do it in the middle of the day when the fish can see the netting versus at night when the fish cannot see it and they're easier to catch. Any betting fisherman would have bet against this command of Jesus to catch anything. Thought it was bad at night? Try doing it during the day. Not only are you going to get hot and, and, and sweaty, but the sun, and, but you, you, you're not going to catch any fish. It won't happen. But not Simon. In verse 5, it says, But Simon answered and said to him, Master, Master. The word means one who is of supreme status. By referring to Jesus as master, what Simon was saying is, you now have full authority over my boat. It's not a theological title. It's a practical declaration saying, Jesus, you're the boss. You now have reign over this. You tell me what you need me to do. Simon's words, by, by, by reading it, we could see he, he said master, but, but then he said, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. So it shows that there was some question about the instructions that he was given. But then he finishes his, his, his uh, doubt by saying, but nevertheless, nevertheless, if you say it, I'll do it. He acted on the word of, of Jesus. Now, Jesus to him was, you know, his teachings. He was a skilled Bible scholar. Boy, he, when he spoke, he, he expounded on the word like no one else. And, and in, in verse, I mean, in chapter 4 of Luke, we see that Jesus did heal Peter's mother-in-law. So this man has healing power. He's, he's a great prophet as well. But at the end of the day, when you look at his hands and when you, when you talk to him, this is just a carpenter. How is someone who, who works with that type of material, going to tell me how to do the job I hear. I'm, we're on the water now. This is, this is my area of expertise. But Simon said, at your word, I will let down the net. Jesus is looking for Simons today, friends. Individuals who will give him full authority over their lives. Individuals who will say, Jesus, you're the boss. Oftentimes, uh, as we're seeking God's will in our, in our lives, it, it may seem like he's, he's wasting our time. It may seem like we're going in directions that don't make sense to us. It may seem even like he doesn't understand our situation because our prayers are not being answered in the way that would, would seem logical as we go through the various uh, scenarios within our lives. But not only does he understand, but he is waiting to bless us in ways beyond our understanding as we surrender control over to him and say, Master, Master. 
what you say at your word, I will do it. So Simon gives Jesus control and the fish fill the boat and and then the second boat has to come over with James and John and, and they fill that boat as well. So Simon is, is sitting there and he's, and he's pulling the fish in and, he, and he's struggling to get it into the boat. And, and, and then he, he, as he's thinking about what's happening and, and realizing the, 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 the ridiculousness of, of this event and how it happened, he knew it was a miracle. He knew it was intervention by, by God. And, and then in verse 8, he's just, he's just beside himself. And he says, when, it says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Notice something, friends. Not just the fact where he said, depart from me, for I am a simple man. He went from calling Jesus master to calling him Lord. He went from surrendering control of the boat to surrendering control of his life. That miracle of the, of the empty net, of this empty net that became full of fish is also the miracle of Simon's empty life being filled by the grace and power and authority of God. When Simon experienced the power of Jesus through his mercy and grace, and I say mercy and grace because Simon was a, a fisherman and we know he had a family, he, he at least had a wife, and a mother-in-law that he lived with, and he had to provide for them. And, and, and each day they, they went without uh, catching fish and being able to, to sell the fish was, was a day that they had to worry about their lives. And here Jesus comes and performs this miracle and, and fills two boats full of fish. As Simon experienced this, this grace and this mercy and, 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 and this answer to a prayer he had not even lifted up, He was humbled. He fell to, the Bible says he fell down at Jesus' knees. Oh, it reminds me, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Peter experienced, or Simon, he's now Simon, experienced this on that boat. He saw this happen and and, and he could do nothing else but fall to his knees and realize that that he is not worthy to be in the presence of this man. He saw Jesus now as Lord of all. And when that boat came to shore, the Bible tells us in verse 11, it says, So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. When he went beyond seeing Jesus as master and and recognized him as Lord, when that boat came to shore, fishing didn't mean a thing. The Bible says that he and his partners, James and John, left everything, left their business, left their nets, left their boat to follow Jesus. Simon went from calling him master or giving up control to calling him Lord and acknowledging his grace and power. He went from surrendering control of this boat on the Sea of Galilee or or Lake Gennesaret to surrendering his life. Friends, Jesus wants to fill your empty nets. He wants to take full control over your life. But he's waiting for you, like Simon, to call him master so that he can show you that he is truly Lord over all. May he fill your empty net with his love and grace. And may you allow Jesus to be Lord of your life. And may you have the experience of falling to your knees and saying with Simon Peter, O Lord, depart from me, I am a sinful man. Because when we do that, what we're doing is we're recognizing our need for Christ. And when we come to that recognition that we need him, he is ready to tell us, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. 
He will be telling us, do not be afraid. I am with you. But we first must acknowledge our need for him in our lives. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for being Lord of all. We thank you for sending Jesus Christ, who is master and Lord over us. Father, I pray that if anyone in the sound of my voice has not given Jesus the chance to surrender their, their desires, to surrender their heart, to surrender their everything to him, that they will take opportunity to do so. So that as they see him working, they will be like Peter and just fall and say, I'm not worthy. But Jesus is worthy and he will call us and woo us to him and bid us to follow him. So Lord, take control. Fill our empty nets with your love and your grace. And we look forward to the day when you come in the clouds of glory and our knees will bow and say that Jesus is Lord. In his name, amen. Next week, we'll be looking at account in John chapter 21, when again, we have empty nets that are filled by Jesus. But we see a different dynamic happening here because this is happening at the beginning of Peter's ministry, and it's done to woo Peter to follow Jesus. But in John chapter 21, at the end of Jesus' ministry on earth, we see that, that the net is being filled to prepare uh, Peter to move forward into the next phase and be led by the Spirit. You won't want to miss it. Join us here next Sabbath as we look at Empty Nets, part two. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his countenance upon you. May he be gracious to you and may he fill you with his peace in Jesus' name. God bless you.